Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. Uh, trust you had a good weekend. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Charles, would you like to lead in prayer? Yes, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning, for us that we are in the morning, and for those that are in another part of the day, Lord, we thank you that you have taken us through the day. And now that we are set, Lord, we pray that you will uh, comfort our hearts, govern our minds, and help us go through this. But Lord Jesus, we will be able to process what you have prepared for us to feed on and be able to apply it in our lives, in the church and in the world that you have placed us in to do your works. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Charles. Right. So we've been covering a lot of ground in First Corinthians, right? Uh, so we last week we looked at chapter 9. So in chapter 9, uh, what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's defending his apostleship. He's saying, uh, as an apostle, I have certain rights, right? Uh, I have certain uh, responsibilities or have things that I can ask for. But as an apostle, as a leader, as somebody who birthed you into Christ, uh, I haven't use the right of an apostle right he says uh you know uh, i refrained from using them meaning he 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 decided that you know, in terms of even working and earning for himself and he never really asked for any kind of uh, help and he says why am i doing that because i i want to be in a place where i'm self sufficient uh but uh, it, it's not that you know, uh, as an apostle, uh, you know, I just become, you know, this man of God, and then I start to dictate terms to people. And then why is he bringing this whole thing of the right of the apostle? Because he's trying to tell the church, see, I am the one who birthed you into Christ. I'm the one who minister the gospel to you. So I have the right to speak into your life, right? I have the right to correct you. So he goes on in the whole of uh, chapter nine, chapter 10, he goes on to address uh, certain warnings from history. He goes back to uh, the Israelites and he says, "Look at the Israelites. You know, they they uh, they were they came out of Egypt, and yet they continued to live uh, an evil life. They continued to live sinful lives. They did what their uh, heart desired, right? And and so God had to, you know, make sure that things that were done." in sin there was judgment for it right so paul is trying to make them understand that these this what we see in history uh, in in uh, in exodus and what happened to the people of israel we as believers must learn from it right and then he touches on that important point of uh, idols and feasts and and the Lord's supper as well right he says he he brings that whole chapter to a close and he says one, uh, idols are nothing, but uh, we don't worship them. We, uh, why? We don't partake in them because we, as believers, partake in the Lord's table. We are in fellowship with God. Same way, if we partake in, uh, uh, you know, feasts or uh, or sacrifices, food sacrifice to idols, it's like we are partaking or communion uh, or fellowshipping with the demon behind that idol. So he says to them, look, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficiary, right? Not everything is beneficial. So you know, it's okay if we do it, but it's not beneficial, right? So he's, he's trying to, you know, bring the believers to a place by saying that, do what is right in the eyes of God, right? Uh, if if it's something that is going to defile or it's something that's going to uh, you know cause sin to come into your life, abstain from it, right? So he closes off with that chapter saying, you know, glorify God in everything that you do. And uh, this week we'll be going to chapter eleven, uh, and here again in chapter eleven, Paul addresses. Two other problems in the church 
right? So we're seeing there are multiple problems in this church, in the church in Corinth, right? And uh, you know, there are two more problems. Uh, one is the, you know, in terms of worship and in terms of, uh, you know, the times when people gather together, uh, the whole issue about head covering. And two is about the Lord's Supper. Right, uh, and this is where he was. Uh, the Apostle Paul was very uh, stern with the believers. Right, so shall we get into chapter eleven? Right. Okay. Let me just present the notes and okay. Chapter eleven. He starts off here. Uh, having addressed the matter of food offered to idols and all of that, he goes into keeping godly traditions. Let's read verse 1 and 2. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Now, this is a powerful statement, right? And it, it just captures the essence of leadership. People, Paul is saying, follow me just as I follow Christ. So as leaders, we must be setting an example in such a way that people are to follow us even as we follow Christ, right? So we are not only to teach, people about Christ, but we must let people see Christ in our lives, right? Now, it's easy to teach, right? We can prepare for, you know, one or two hours, right? Understand the whole summary of a couple of chapters or a, or a passage of scripture, and then it's easy to teach about it. But what Paul is saying is, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. He doesn't say, Teach Christ just as how I teach Christ. No, he says, imitate me just as how I imitate Christ. Right? And, and this is very, very powerful. So Paul has come to a place, the Apostle Paul has come to a place where he's saying, I have done everything in line with the will of God, or I am obedient to all his, uh, you know, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm obedient to God's word. And I'm pursuing God. So he's so confident. He's saying, pursue me. I mean, uh, I mean, follow me just as I follow Christ. Right now, can we say that to people who we are, you know, uh, overseeing? We say, follow me just as I follow Christ. Basically, it means that we are to portray uh, Christ-like values in our lives. Right? As leaders, we are to come to this place of just being humble, being able to, uh, you know, show mercy, show love, show grace, and and let people see Christ in our lives, right? Then Paul commends them for keeping the traditions in verse 2. He says that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you, right? Now, what are those traditions? It is most likely those traditions are that of the Lord's table and water baptism. Now we know that Paul has, the Apostle Paul has come from the Judaism. And in Judaism, there are plenty of traditions, laws to be kept. Now we know that Paul is not talking about that because in Galatia, to the church in Galatia, he says the law is, is powerless. Once what for what Christ did, the law becomes powerless, right? So he's not focusing on the law here, but he's saying you are keeping traditions. So uh, you know, probably they are having the Lord's table every now and then, and they are having also water baptism. They're teaching people about water baptism, right? Now, here's the problem. Paul then proceeds to address matters of head covering for women and proper participation in the Lord's table. So you see here, Paul is saying, it's good you're following the traditions, but even as you're doing it, do it the right way. But the problem with you as believers is you're not doing it the right way. 
right? Uh, the Lord's table. You're, you're, you're doing it just because I have given you uh, the instructions. You're doing it. That's good. But you're doing it the wrong way. Right? So it's like this. If, if for example, somebody gives you a task, right? Uh, gives any one, of one, any one of us a task. Right? The task is to clean us a room. Right? So what if I clean the room? Right? And I follow the instructions. I clean the room, but I forget to, you know, dust off the walls, but I only sweep the ground, right? But I forget to dust off the walls and the corners of the walls. Now, I've done what has been asked, but I've not done a good job out of it. I've done partially what has been asked. So Paul is trying to address this problem here, right? And, and, and look at this, right? Here, first thing, spiritual headship. In in First Corinthians eleven three, he talks about that, right? Uh, now, let's look at that later on. But let's just look at this comparison here. So, things that are addressed in other places in Scripture, especially the New Testament, and addressed exclusively to the Corinthian church, right? So now we must understand there are some traditions or we say some practices that we follow exclusively uh, for the Corinthian church, exclusively for the different churches that he was writing to. But there are certain places where scripture teaches us that it's, it is for the entire church, right? Now, spiritual headship, what do you think about it? It's for the entire church, right? Whether we are a you know, in, in a city, in a village, in a, uh, in a town, whether we are English, Canada, or any other regional language, there needs to be spiritual headship. So it's for all churches. Right. Now, what about head covering? Now, when you look at head covering, there is a context as to why Paul writes and he says there, you know, we look at the chapter there uh, later on, uh, why does he say head covering? It is exclusively for the church in Corinth. Now, he does not mention this to the church in uh, you know, Ephesus. He does not mention it to the church in, uh, in Galatia or in you know, uh, any, any other churches, right? In Thessalonica or Philippi. He does not mention all this. Right? But why does he exclusively say women cover your head? Right? So we look at that. Why does he say that, right? Later on. Now, uh, the Lord's table, right? Now, the Lord's table is for the entire church, right? Each one of us, everyone must partake in the Lord's table, right? Those who have accepted the Lord, who have received him as their personal savior, walking in fellowship with God, must partake of the Lord's table, right? And the Lord himself said, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, uh, and in the book of Acts, we see that they partook in the Lord's table whenever they could, right? Uh, Paul himself says, whenever you meet, partake in the Lord's table, right? Even the Corinthians, he tells them, partake in the Lord's table. Right, now he's addressing a matter within the church in Corinth. He's saying, now you all are coming, you are partaking in the Lord's table as if it is food and some, you know, drinks. So he goes on to say, don't you know that when you're partaking, you're partaking in the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus? Don't you have food at home? Don't you have homes where you can have your food and, and drink and make merry? So he's, you know, exhorting the church. He's giving them a stern warning, right? They're not to... Uh, you know, partake in this Lord's table in an unworthy manner. Now, does he talk about this in other churches, to other churches? He doesn't, right? He, he's just talking to it, to the Corinthian church, right? And then in, the, in, in, in terms of the New Testament, women can, or the entire church, women can pray, prophesy, and preach, right? Uh, and here he's... He's, there are a lot of scriptures there. We see in the book of Acts, uh, the apostle Paul himself raises up many leaders who were women, uh, and and you know uh, they they were used in the church, right? So even now, 
uh, women are being used in the church. They can pray, they can prophesy, they can preach, they can teach, they can uh, flow in the gifts of the Spirit. But when we look at it on the other side, the Apostle Paul tells two churches, for the church in Corinth and the church in Ephesus, for women to be silent. He does not say this to the Roman church. He does not say to the church in Galatia, women be silent. Right? Uh, because we know that you know people who are helping in the Roman church, uh, Aquila and Priscilla were helping, right? Uh, so nowhere is it mentioned that Paul said only uh, Aquila to do the things. No, Aquila and Priscilla as a couple they minister. There was Phoebe, there was Lydia, there was there were many women who God used and Paul raised up. Again, we must take text and put it into context, right? So. From what we see here, right, the Lord's table is for every church. Spiritual headship is for every church, right? Uh, women to preach is for every church. So we are not to take this scripture and say, hey, Paul said, you know, uh, women should keep quiet, should be silent. So now uh, women should not preach. Now we must remember that is exclusively for the church in Corinth, right? So let's look at chapter three onwards, and we'll sorry verse three onwards, and we'll talk about the spiritual headship and head covering, right? Let's look at that verse three. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, for that is one and, and same as if her head were shaved. Let's go down. Verse 6. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because the, of the angels. Nevertheless, Neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Right? So let's break down these verses. Right? This, this is very important for all of us to, remember, to understand. Verse 3, he says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Right Now, we are seeing here the revelation of truth concerning spiritual authority, right? The head of every man is Christ, right? Now, the word head in the Greek is kephale, which is met metaphorically representing authority, headship, or, or, or government, right? So the head of the woman, right, is the man. So here we will have to understand this uh, specifically for married women, right? Because her head is, is specifically her husband. So it will also apply to a local church setting where women submit to the appointed leader. Now, let's look at that example there. It would be absurd to apply it generally to other situations. Example. One cannot expect a 60-year-old woman to submit to a random 25-year-old man. Now, we see here that when Paul is saying, woman, your head is the man, the man is referring to the husband, right? It's not just some random man, right? It is the husband, right? The head of every man is Christ, right? And now this is referring to the believer, right? It's not just any man. The believer, as a believer, 
the head of every man is Christ. And the head of Christ is God, referring to God the Father, right? So, so here we see that the believing man himself willingly submits to the Lordship of Christ over his life because he or she he is following the example of Christ. Now look at this spirit, the cultural context, right? This is what we want to get at. Now it's I've I've underlined it here, marked it yellow so that we can all just focus on this. Right. I'm going to read this passage, right? The Corinthian cultural context was such that while women typically had long hair, a married woman would have her head covered, while a prostitute typically had her head shown or shaved. So we can imagine that there were all kinds of women coming from such backgrounds who had been saved and were now part of the local church. Hence, in view of both their cultural context and the backgrounds from where they come from, Paul is instructing all women to cover their heads while praying or prophesying in the local church. Right? In the church in Corinth, there was the, the temple, Aphrodite, thousand male prostitutes, thousand female prostitutes. Now, the male would just be, right, they would just be however they are, but women. As, as prostitutes, they would shave their head. So for example, if they see a woman in, in the marketplace and their head is shaved, they will know that that woman is a prostitute. Right? Now, what's happening? Maybe there are women who have, you know, have shaved their head or shorn, but they've accepted Christ after that. And they've come into church. Right? Now they are new, they are a new person, they are new in the inside. So Paul is saying, just to avoid any problems, any confusions, all women cover your head. So this will show that you are coming under the headship, spiritual headship of the leader of the church. And two, this will also show that you're honoring God in what you're doing. So whether women have long hair, whether they are shaved, whether they are shorn, whatever it is, Paul is saying, women, you cover your head for now. Why? Because if you don't cover, it will be like people will think you're a prostitute coming into church. right? Now, nothing wrong with that. But if you've come into the church, you believe, become a believer, you need to show others that now you are no longer a prostitute, but you are under the headship of the uh, you know, the pastor, the leader of the church, and you are under Christ. Right? And so that is why Paul is saying, cover your head. That is the cultural context as to why the head covering is happens, right? Now, in the nation, in our nation, especially in India, uh, I don't know about other countries, but, uh, but in India, you know, especially if you go into North India, we see a lot of, uh, you know, all of all women, right? They cover their head as a sign of uh, respect to God. Now, it is a cultural setting to Corinth, but that tradition has somehow followed on. Maybe you know, uh, just through some teaching, and you know, so women cover their head. Now, just because they cover their head, we don't have to go and tell them, no, no, don't cover your head. Right, uh, uh, you should not cover your head because you're not a prostitute. Paul was writing it to the Corinthian church. We don't have to explain all of that, right? If they are doing, if they are covering their head even now, let them do it. You don't have to cause a strife because of that head covering. Right now, we especially we travel all, all across North India. We go to many places, right? We see, uh, you know, women covering their head. Uh, and praying, we see that you know people take off their shoes or their footwear and they get into church barefoot because they're, they're traditions, right? So certain traditions which don't affect the, you know, the the spiritual side of our life, it's all right. Now, if we cover our head and pray, God will answer. If we don't cover the head and pray, still God will answer, right? But what we're trying to come uh, you know to gather from this whole point here is that paul has written it exclusively for the corinthian church 
because the women who are prostitutes will usually shave their head and now if they have become they've come into the church he's trying to make them say that by covering the head you're saying you're under the leadership of your husband if you're not married you're under the leadership of your spiritual leader in the church and so much so you're under the leadership of god right so he goes on verse 10 for this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels right now paul is explaining why it is important to have an expression of submission under spiritual authority because god has intended for angels to learn from the church can you believe that right god has intended angels to learn from the church so picture this right maybe god is in heaven yeah and he's telling the angels see that is how you know you should worship god that is how you should probably preach or this is how you know now i'm just putting me painting a picture right for you but he intends that right ephesians 3 10 it says to the intent now that now the manifold wisdom of god may might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places right so so it is a symbol of, of like we are an example to the angels so Paul is saying what you're doing in this church in Corinth is going to be an example for the angels. Right? Or they have they will learn from us. Now, are they going to have a church and all of that? No, they may not have that. But that that's how God has ordained it. Right? So it's wonderful to see, you know, this this context. So maybe some of us especially those in India and maybe even in, I, I'm not sure about African uh, in Africa and other continents uh, but in India if you're getting an opportunity to minister and uh, this whole point comes up it's it's a simple explanation right it's not very complicated all you have to say is you know in Corinth this was the background prostitutes used to shave their head walk around without covering their head so that you know men would know that he or she is a prostitute and so okay uh, i'll just get to that one minute yes mangi go ahead please thank you pastor uh just to, wanted to clarify uh at the point of the angel learning because uh yeah it's it's a new concept so because he yeah. he, he said that it's because of the angels so how do you get to to know that thank you pastor yes yes so the the verse itself uh says that uh, mangi so one minute. let me just go back there sorry uh is it presenting to you now are you able to see the notes yeah okay i think I, yes, I, past, yeah. I just one minute sorry i'll just post that again Okay, so here it says here, verse 10, uh, Mangi, it says, for this reason, the woman ought to have the symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. In the sense that uh, Paul is explaining why is it important. He's saying because God has intended angels to learn from the church. Right? So he's given, there's a verse there also in Ephesians 3.10. Now, now we know that we are made in God's image, right? We also know that we are, the book of Hebrews says, we are higher than angels, right? Our authority, our place is higher than that of angels, right? And two, we also know that some of us, uh, the book of Revelations talk about it, and even Paul talks about it later on. He says, some of us will judge the angels, right? Now, how we'll do that, we don't know right we there this is uh we cannot explain how that judgment is going to happen uh but we we must understand we must know that angels are you know god says no i've set his angels charge over you 
So angels are there. There are different kinds of angels, and we can study a lot about that. But every angel, right? Whether they are seraphims, cherubims, oh, right? Whatever angel, they all have the opportunity to learn from this relationship that we have with God. Now remember, Christ died not for the angels. Christ died for us, for man. Right. So we have this personal relationship with, with, the, with the God the Father, with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a personal relationship. The angels don't have the Holy Spirit. Right, so when they see us walking in the gifts of the Holy Spirit or ministering in the gifts, and they see us, uh, you know, serving or the uh, the manifold, it says there in Ephesians three ten, to the intent that the manifold, which means the many, the the uh, different assets of the wisdom of God, might be known by the church, right, to the powers principalities and powers of heavenly places right so this is known to angels that they will learn from it right now who is going to how will they learn from it that is something that god has ordained right god will you know probably minister to them in their own way but as they are watching us they are seeing this personal relationship that we have with God the Father, with the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So this this is something that is you know not comprehensive. I mean, not comprehensible. Meaning we can't wrap our minds around this, right? That that God has set us above these heavenly beings, these angels that are so beautiful or so great and so mighty. God has placed us above them, and they will learn from uh, what we are doing in the church, right? So, Mangi, how they will learn? That is something that you know uh, God will ordain their learnings on how they will learn. Uh, but as for us, we must ensure that what we are doing, people are learning. Our, you know, fellow believers and people around us are looking and learning, and also. It's for angels. Angels are learning from what we are doing within the church. Right? So, yes, Mangi, I hope that answers your question. Right? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. You. All right. So, let's get back there. Sorry, it keeps going off. Just give me one minute, please. Oh. Okay. All right. So verse 16. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have we have no such custom, or nor do the churches of God. Now, here this verse indicates the practice of head covering was a custom specific to the Corinthian church. Right. Now, if this is this matter has settled, Paul has settled this matter, he's saying, okay. Women, you cover your head because I've because this is the reason why you have to do it, right? And men, don't cover your head because it's not meant for you. It is meant for women, and because women are the ones who, uh, uh, you know, who are who are under the headship or the under the uh, leadership of the man, right? Now, verse seventeen onwards, he goes into this big, big problem within the church. Which is the Lord's table, right? So now picture this: what's happening in the church? Probably people are entering the right. I'm just giving you a picture of what's happening. Probably people are coming into church as they're entering. They're going to the Lord's table. They're having the bread and juice, discussing among themselves, talking about what happened over the last few weeks, talking about you know. You know other matters and then they come they sit for the service and then suddenly in between the service some of them are getting up going partaking in the lord's table or maybe some of them after church are going uh you know just partaking of the 
food uh, like like it was food you know just having the bread and the uh, way the wine and just there was no order right what are they doing they're doing the right thing what partaking the lord's table but they're not doing it the right way right now remember god is a god of order right there's no chaos there's no confusion in the things that he does right so see how what apostle paul uh, instructs them now verse 17 now i'm giving these instructions i do not praise you right just a few verses before he says it's good you all are keeping the customs that i have taught you but here he's going on he's saying i i'm giving you these instructions i do not praise you since you came together not for the better but for the worse first of all when you come together as a church i hear that there are divisions among you and in part i believe it right now this whole thing of division he's he's talked about it he's saying he's bringing it across here again there's division among you now there's a reason it's not like paul is saying uh, you know he's just going on nagging about the problems no the reason is when because of divisions what's happening is there are different groups of people having the lord's table at different timings and different ways again causing further divisions right so he goes on for there must be also for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you therefore when you come together in one place it is not to eat the lord's supper for an eating each one takes his own supper ahead of others one is hungry and another is drunk now see this emphatic verse in verse 22 he says what do you not have houses to eat or drink in or do you despise the church of god and shame those who have nothing what shall i say to you shall i praise you in this i do not praise you right he's very stern he's saying there are some who come early there are some who come late and some are hungry so they go partake in the lord's table as if it was food and you know something to drink and some of them are getting drunk with that and is this something that i should praise you for what you're doing he says no you, you, the verse 22 he's he, that first word what right it, it just shows the the concern those and the surprise or that element of you know uh, 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 unbelievable so the apostle paul is saying i cannot believe that you people are doing this being believers who have who are flowing in the gifts of the spirit understanding you know uh, you've been in the church you're you're you know you have been established in god's word how can you do this then he goes on verse 23 for what i received from the lord that which i also delivered to you that the lord jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and he when he had given th thanks he broke it and said take it this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink drink it in remembrance of me now have you ever wondered why paul is repeating this right now i thought about it and i feel that what's happened is he's gone to corinth many years back and he's explained to them probably he's told them you know what uh, this is what jesus he came into this world he you know he's pointing them to the uh, uh, to the old testament scriptures then he's pointing them to how jesus fulfilled those scriptures and how he came as a man the miracles he did how he died he uh, he was he rose again from the dead and he's probably explained to them in person the whole thing of uh, you know the lord's table and how when we partake in the bread we are partaking in his body this and when we partake of the wine we are partaking of the blood that was that was shared uh, sacrificed on the cross so he has shared with them verbally this is the first time he's writing it to them why maybe because they have forgotten right what's happened the church has formed maybe there were 10 people just giving an example right maybe there were 10 people 
all of them are partaking very sincerely in the Lord's table. And the church has grown to maybe 50, 100 people. Now, all of a sudden, people who are coming into the church don't even know why they're doing it. Why Paul has said it long back. So Paul said, do it. Maybe there was no proper teaching also at that time. So Paul is reminding the believers, see, what you are doing is you're doing what the Lord Jesus himself has commanded us. That when we eat of his body and we drink of his cup, we are partaking in the new covenant. Right? We are partaking in his death, his burial, his resurrection. And you people as believers, that such a such a uh, awesome or such a important deed that we do, a custom that we'd have of the Lord's table must be done in such reverence. But you all are partaking of it as if it is of 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 you know no significance. You're partaking it of it as if it is just regular food, and he is upset. Right. Verse 25, he says, sorry, verse 26. Uh, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So he's saying, if we eat in an unworthy manner, we're bringing judgment upon ourselves, right? So let's get into, let's just look here, disorder during communion. Now, the Corinthian church was a very spiritual group of people. Paul has addressed a lot of problems. Now, instead of treating this uh, whole aspect of the Lord's table with reverence, it's become a, you know, how do I say this? Like a potluck. It's become a, a time of just feasting and eating and drinking. Paul says, go and do this at home. Right? What was intended for the Lord to be done of great reverence has become more of a feast. Now, instead of enjoying the benefits of the cross, what is happening to the Corinthians? They're dishonoring the sacred table and they are putting judgment upon themselves. And as a result of this, many were becoming sick, weak. Many were dying prematurely. And many were having all kinds of problems in their lives. Right? Because they were having it, having this partaking in the Lord's table just out of, you know, ignorance and just, you know, not in a worthy manner. So this is very important, right? Imagine us as believers. We are partaking in the Lord's table. And even as we partake, remember, we are sitting with the Lord Jesus. We are, we are, we are remembering what he did. It signifies that bread or that grape juice. And that, you know, it could just be a piece of bread. But when we do it in remembrance of him, the power of the resurrection power of, of the Lord Jesus Christ enters into it. Right? So if we are partaking of it in an unworthy manner, now some of the ways now, if you put it into context now, I'm sure all of us, you know, we know that we must partake in the right manner. But what if we are, you know, we are holding the communion, we are partaking of it, and our phone is ringing. Or maybe you know we're in church, or uh, we're distracted with what something else, somebody else is doing. Right? We are not looking at the cross. We're not thinking of the cross. What's happening? What is happening is we are getting distracted, and we are going to be taking that in an unworthy manner because we're not thinking, we're not proclaiming what Jesus did for us. So we just imagine, okay, just picture this, right? Imagine you're taking the Lord's table and suddenly your phone rings and you stop that. You pick up the phone, you talk. Now, we know it's not right. We know it's not right because 
It just takes a few minutes, right? But as, even as we do it, we must do it in reverence. Whether we cover our head, whether we take out our shoe, doesn't matter, right? We can cover our head and think of hundred other things, other than what the cross, you know, uh, what you know, proclaiming what Jesus did on the cross. We can take off our shoe and say, "Oh, this is holy time," but think about all other things. So it's not about the physical, but it's about the spiritual, right? Now, when we don't take it in a in a fearful manner, in reverence, in a thankful manner. What are we proclaiming? We have a list here uh, of the proclamation when we are partaking in the Lord's table. right? So I'm just going to highlight it also even as we just do that. See, first one, all our sins were paid for, so we are in right standing before God. Imagine, maybe a couple of weeks previous to this, we we or a few days before we have committed sin, we've got angry or hurt somebody or said something wrong. But on Sunday, we're at church, right? And we are holding that the Lord's Supper, we're, we're getting ready to have it. The Holy Spirit reminds us, you know, these are the things that you have done which are not pleasing in my eyes. That's our moment where we say, God, forgive me for my sins. And I thank you that even as I partake of this, I receive your forgiveness. All our sins are paid for. So then when we've received it, we have a right standing before God. You see that? Right? We don't have to be in condemnation or in continuing to live in sin. Two, the power of sin is broken. When we partake of it, we're saying, God, Lord, even as I partake of this, the power of sin, what you did on the cross, you broke the power of sin. And now, because of that, I don't have to live under sin because I'm partaking in your body, in your blood. Right? Most importantly, Jesus removed our sicknesses. Because Isaiah says, by his stripes, we are healed. So even as we're partaking, you can pray for your healing over your body, healing over your mind, over your spirit, your soul, emotional healing, any pain, anything that you're going through. Jesus can bring healing. Right now, we must remember this is not some magic potion, but right, many a times we may think, okay, if I have the Lord's table, then everything will be okay. No, we must proclaim this, we must understand this. It's not a you know, healing portion or a healing thing that just happens automatically. No, right? We must understand that we're proclaiming this on the cross. Then we are saying Jesus paid the punishment so we can have shalom or well being, right? Jesus paid the punishment. When we're partaking of it, we're saying, God, I was supposed to be on that cross. I was supposed to take up that punishment, but Jesus, you took it up for me so that. The Father and me and I, we have uh, our relationship is that of complete shalom. There's peace. What does the Bible say? Paul says, right? And the God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. Right? We have the peace of God. Jesus removed the curse of the law. Right? Now, the law was a curse because even though they did all those sacrifices, all those you know offerings, there was no forgiveness of sins. So that's why it's called a curse. Because there's no forgiveness. There was no right standing before God. There were blessings of Abraham, right? Now, the Lord Jesus is saying, not only are you going to get the blessings of Abraham, but I'm going to give you the blessings of the cross as well. So you no more have to say, okay, I, I've not obeyed this law, that law, but the curse of that law is gone. And you can live in, you know, in freedom, in, in wholeness, right? Next one, the power of sin was destroyed. So we have complete mastery over Satan and his demons. Paul says in, in Colossians chapter 1, I guess, he says, yes, Colossians 1, he says, uh, uh, 
having overpowered right i think yeah uh, verse 16 for for by him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or rulers or authorities all things were created by him and for him right so he paul is saying that he as as believers we have the authority complete mastery over satan right so satan will come his demons will come but you and i have complete authority over it we need to believe in that authority right and we are redeemed by god's blood we are his possession he has paid the price for us to be redeemed so devil does not have authority over us unless we give it to him right so one drop of blood of the blood of jesus destroys everything that satan can do right uh, okay let's take a break we'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue from here right thank you <laughs> 